said, everybody's very welcome. Delighted to have um, to welcome you to um, this the 2021 Chair's Invitational Lecture from BCS Northern Ireland. And i um, very excited to have Neve McElhatton, who has joined us to for our talk this evening. Um, and Neve is going to talk about uh, how AI can improve healthcare outcomes. Um, so our format this evening, um, as you know, we're recording the event. And our format is that Neve's going to give us her talk about um, AI and outcomes. Um, we we'll followed that by a panel session and uh, which we're going to have a number of speakers join us in the panel to discuss um, uh, the AI and, and thoughts about AI. And I'd like to welcome Fabian Campbell-West from Leopa, uh, a Northern Ireland um, company who are doing great things in the healthcare in UK wide. Um, joined by Sinead McCracken Gillespie, who's actually embarking on her journey on the AI world. So she needs to share our ideas and thoughts around um, the AI and that whole introduction to it. And we're delighted that uh, Dr. Bill Mitchell, who is the Director of Policy from BCS uh, and works very closely, works closely with the AI um, government office uh, in the UK, is going to host and chair the panel session. So I'm not going to say too much, um, just in, in to welcome and introduce Neve, who needs no introduction to many, I'm sure. Uh, so Neve is one of our Ireland's top five uh, entrepreneurs, recognised by the Irish Times, and she is definitely one of our best serial entrepreneurs and has a number of exits under her belt, which is fair credit to, to Neve for all the success. Um, but that's not the end. There's always plenty more, and he's continuing to 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 push uh, and challenges and. Um, at the moment now, Neve is CEO of Stimuli AI, which is an AI solution um, going to support hospitals to reduce waiting lists. And I'm excited to hear about what the good work that they're doing. Uh, and Neve is responsible for driving this um, wonderful business, the strategic planning, business development, and identification of partnerships globally. Um, and as, as I said, Neve is very much uh, active in supporting IT, speaking at a number of events, STEM ambassador, and a guest lecture at the Ulster University. And let's not forget, creator of the She Says Club. So Neve, you're very welcome. Just hand over to you and Thank forward you so to you, Josh. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, I always find it so bizarre talking to a screen when I can only see some of your lovely faces. Um, but I, I'm just going to caveat my hat that I'm wearing tonight because I realise some of you are absolute experts in this field. So this is very much my mutterings and experience over the last while um, in the evolution of, of stimuli. Um, I've always been an, an avid uh, observer of the world of technology and in health. And in fact, um, you know, it goes back to Smart Global. We ran an event back in 2018 that was Smart Health. Um, and I have to say it really struck a chord with me back then with the fabulous Dr. Shane McKee talking about genomics. We had Tony Bergen talking about personalized medicine. We had some of the guys from um, University down in Cork talking about the connectivity and 5G and what it could do and emergency care and, and all of this stuff really just fascinated me. Um, and especially when it came to that tech for good, you know, technology that makes a difference. Um, and I'm sure, you know, Facebook are feeling the wrath of tech for not good this week. Um, so, you know, huge implications there. Um, but for tonight, uh, I'm going to kind of share my experiences and, and what we have found over the last um, few months when it comes to rolling out a uh, healthcare solution in, in, in the space. So first thing first, uh, and this is always the question that we get asked, is what is AI? Um, if you come from Tyrone, it has a completely different meaning than artificial intelligence. So, um, you know, and, and this is a minefield because when we start to look at you know, machine learning and robotics and deep learning, you know, it can all, we can all get very lost in it. Um, and I suppose it's only because I've really immersed myself in it. You know, I'm, I'm you know, all self-taught. I read, I learn, I listen, you know, um, and I, I just love, you know, hearing from other people. But um, I find this as the simplest kind of way of putting what AI is. And it's a technology built by humans that enables machine to learn to perform tasks um, and they learn over and over and over and over again from those patterns. So um, I'm going to take you through uh, a few key facts um, that actually when I was doing a bit of research on this was quite phenomenal. Um, 
AI in healthcare is predicted to grow at an annualized 48% uh, between 2017 and 2013. And in fact, I, I actually wrote this down because I read an article in the Times the other day. Um, I, I don't know if you've seen it. It was about the billions that has been allocated to the NHS, but is it actually enough? And I wrote the statistic down. It said that 20 years ago, health services accounted for 27% of all day-to-day -day government public spending. That's now to rise to 44%, which is double the amount on education and four times the amount spent on defence. So it's when you actually say those numbers out loud, you just think how vast, how large, you know, and how much money is pumped into the space. You kind of want to be utilizing technology and artificial intelligence to get it right so that there's real value there. Um, and I know uh, I tried to stay away from this, but um, I couldn't. Good old COVID. It has completely accelerated healthcare technology. Um, and this is the thing that's really got me thinking is that all of this was already available, but because of the pandemic, because we went into lockdown, we nearly went into, you know, survival of the most agile if we look at Darwin. And for me, prior to COVID and the utilization of AI technology, especially in healthcare, AI was this buzzword, you know, it was an algorithm that maybe we were exposed to in Spotify or Netflix, you know, given our kind of best recommendations. But now, given the pandemic and how we've survived over the last 20 odd months, this has been a phenomenal change. Um, and you look at businesses that were lost leaders pre-COVID who are now absolute champions um, and massive winners because of how they were agile enough to kind of transform their business and their offering to really help people through the pandemic. So, and I talk about one of those in particular after. So this is another question um, that we get asked quite regularly. Is AI replacing the professionals? Are they robots? You know, are they taking over our jobs? And they're not, you know, and definitely not. They're just, it's there to empower them, to let them do what they're good at. And for all the discussions that I've had of late with clinicians and doctors and surgeons, and, you know, I've had many of the conversation challenging um, as they, they may be. The reality is they are so precious for time as it is given what they're trying to do, by utilizing AI solutions uh, in the right way, it automates these laborious processes that eat into so much time of maybe their nurses, their admin teams and so on. So we need to really look at the positives and the good and what AI actually presents to our health systems, not just the front end of the cold face of it, but in the back end, the admin teams, the strategic planning, the performance delivery units, all of that. And collectively, if all of those dots are connected, it's going to be a really powerful tool. But the challenge we have at the minute is actually getting that right. Because when we get AI into our ecosystem, the benefits of automation are amazing. Not only from patient experience to patient care, but when healthcare is delivered and automated at a faster pace, you know, whilst absolutely yes, there can be colossal upfront costs, but over time that brings those significant costs down. So it's about finding the balance um, and at what point of entry do you take the technology in and what problem is it going to solve? Because we all know, and I will talk about our solution in a minute, you know, the hot topic, the buzzword in health now is about reducing hospital waiting lists. And we've been talking about this for years, but we, we don't seem to be any further forward on it, you know, for all the talk that's been done. Um, I just wanted to throw a few of these words into the mix, um, because when we talk about the world of AI, it's about understanding the difference, uh, you know, AI and machine learning and what's the difference and data and, you know, you know, deep learning. And when I started to read all of this, I have to say I got very overwhelmed uh, and I had to go back to my notes quite a few times to try and understand the, dif the difference um, and to try and understand what parts of AI will fall into our solution. And we're very much driven by AI. So if you can imagine that AI is the world and then the likes of your, you know, your data and your machine learning and your algorithms are all subsets of that. But without the data, we can't really start to utilize any of this. And for me, that has been the 
biggest learning over the last while is the importance of data and it's the importance of the right data. And I actually think that's one of the biggest hurdles that health services face today is that they don't actually understand the data that they have. They don't understand how to use it. They don't understand how to extract it and what to do with it and, and the value that it can add to understanding how they can deliver better patient care. So there's all of this um, to, to consider when it comes to utilizing AI in, in any, in any um, sector. So a few things um, that have really come to light over the last month, or well, last few months, are electronic health records. We've all have heard of this. Like it sounds like the most simple thing that should be readily available, but unfortunately it's not. Um, there's huge hurdles and challenges with GDPR compliance. Um, and many of you on this call tonight will know about the Encompass team that the HSE have created. They've invested, I think, two or 300 million with a system called Epic. Um, and it's a, it's a big US software platform that's you know, really built for uh, delivering a full ecosystem and, and supply chain of services and technologies to health, health services with the core focus of the electronic health records. Um, and just a little random fact, the founder of Epic, her parents are from Donegal. <laughs> Just totally random. So um, there you go, Sinead. <laughs> um, other kind of really strong utilization of solutions have been improved staffing, typically based on patient predictions. So, you know, we, we talk about the lack of resource. Um, in some cases, we're, we're over resourced and there's not enough patient flow coming through. So there's software solutions out there that will actually allow you to use historical data to predict the future of, of patients coming through to improve your staffing rotas. Um, one of the big things that we've seen has been transformative and even still now with our GPs is telemedicine. You know, never did we think that we would take for granted about actually phoning the doctor at any time of the day to say, you know, we've got a sore head and they would say, come on in. Now it's a completely different regimented you know, detached process. There's nothing personal about it, but using solutions in the world of telemedicine has really probably helped so many people get faster diagnosis, you know, get seen quicker. And again, it's reducing that kind of wasted time with people as well. Um, Real-time alerting. Um, it would be interesting to see, um, I can't obviously see you all on my screen because it's in presentation mode, but I would like after, to see how many of you are committed to your wearable 24 seven, everybody with their Fitbit, their Apple watch, you know, do you, you know, check your resting heartbeat? Do you, you know, count your steps? Do you do all of that? Um, I see you shaking your head there. Um, I can't see, I can't see your name. Is it Paul? No. Yeah, Paul. Um, do you not, you don't wear your Fitbit? No. I, I don't, because I have to confess, the one that I have, I think is the most useless piece of technology I've ever been given, Neve. Yeah. if I'm being honest. Yeah, well, I have, I have a, I, now you're going to be shocked, I'm a Samsung girl, I love my iPad and I love my iMac, but I'm a Samsung phone, and I have the S, the Gear S2, and I love it when it's charged, but it's just such, such a painful thing to charge, I mean, I, then I forget to put it back on, so for me, I'm, I'm not one of the, the advocates of that. Um. Other solutions that we've seen then as well is patient engagement. And I have a couple of examples too, but the really exciting thing for me is the diagnosis, the, the potential uh, support with oncology, cancer diagnosis, personalized medicines, um, and utilizing the historical data to give you those predictions of potential future um, requirements. Um, and yes, you know, there, there's a lot of things, you know, as we discover all of this, but some of the case studies and, and lectures that I've gone to lately, you know, with Microsoft and AWS and, and, and some of the global case studies of work that has been done has just been phenomenal to think, you know, we have built this. But the algorithm has learned this in a completely different environment, which has done something that would take us years at a superhuman rate. So for me, it just blows my mind um, when we see what solutions have come to market. You know, in Ireland, um, and I, I try to be very um, specific with the, the guys, I'm going to show you in a minute, that they're actually Irish companies, bar one. Um, and the other thing then is informed strategic, strategic planning. 
which nicely leads me on to our new solution, um, which is, is Stimuli. Um, and just to kind of give you a bit of insight to our project, um, Stimuli in, in its very essence has been around for over a decade now. And the guys at UCC in Cork in the Insights Lab were appointed by the HSE to, to do a piece of research really to try and understand why bottlenecks arise in the first place. So they went to outpatients, they went to diagnostics, and then they got into different specialities within the hospital because typically people think that there's that point of entry. Um, and if you fix that, the throughput and outflows will then, you know, divvy off. They don't. Every clinic at the moment is suffering from, you know, a, a buildup or, or a backlog of patients. But the important part is, um, and I'm apologizing to any health professionals on here today, there's a lot of assumptions made on why the, the clinic delivers and, and why it doesn't. So what the guys did, the, the, the team, um, they started to do a number of pilots uh, to validate the, the academic research findings. And in actual fact, nine out of 10 times when they went in and consulted with the department, they found that what the department thought was the problem wasn't the problem. So I came on the scene. It was actually in around the time I delivered the Smart Health event. Um, and I was introduced to Professor Barry O'Sullivan, who is the director of the Insights Lab and a full professor in constraint programming um, in UCC. And Barry and I had a brilliant conversation. We were actually introduced through a newspaper article that we were both featured in. Um, and me being me, the serial kind of networker and nosy person, I needed to find out um, who he was <laughs> and what he did um, and to see if he would speak at one of my events. Um, and when I was down in the university, they took me through this whole raft of uh, projects they were working on, but this, this particular project stood out it, at that time had no name and it was known as a strategic planning tool uh, that could help hospitals reduce their waiting lists so I didn't actually hear anything after that because I was like well what is that doing collecting dust and he was like well we're academics you know it's, it's not something that we do and I said well <laughs> I'm not how do we commercialize this um and that was literally three and a half, nearly four years ago now, and waiting lists were a problem there. So last July, we picked up the conversation again, and you know, waiting lists were just literally spiraling, spiraling out of control. And we were at the cold face of it as well. Personal, you know, experiences of family members being on waiting lists and so on. You could see the impact it was having. You could see people that needed basic treatment were getting other conditions that was actually debilitating to their well-being and you were thinking well hang on a second something has there has to be an intervention here so Barry and I got our heads together we got the company spun out um, and we officially started in August this year and we've made great progress and we're having fabulous conversations um, uh, with you know hospitals we have a number of pilots running in, in England we have two pilots running here in Northern Ireland and we're working with a couple of Canadian companies to to get um pilots up and running in Canada as well um and to put it in the simplest of forms what what happens is we'll take a speciality and our point of entry is diagnostics so we'll go in at imaging we'll go in endoscopy um etc um, and we'll work with that department. We'll get the historical data, which is quite basic. We'll take that information and through the stimuli simulation, we can create a demand model for their clinic. Uh, and it's based on real time. It's based on the, the actual resource they have to hand. We never make assumptions. We never say, oh, if you had 10 more doctors or another porter or whatever. And we give them uh, three or four different reports on how they could actually design their clinic. So that it would help reduce that waiting list and we give them that strategy to implement so it's very exciting um, there's lots of work to do we are in the middle of building our cloud application on azure which is is, is great fun but um i'm very excited to to roll this out over the next while and to, to see what happens 
Um, but I'll not I'll not dwell too much time in stimuli because if I get into the nitty gritty, we'll be here at 10 o'clock tonight. And I don't want to do that to you. But if any of you do have any questions, you're you're more than welcome to email me after on it. Just a few um, other companies that I wanted to kind of raise awareness of. I'm sure you've all seen Babylon, you know, the DP at hand. Um, I think they've just listed in the stock market there for 4.2 billion, uh, which is a nice lift just before Christmas. Um, and these guys were actually one of the loss leaders um, that I mentioned at the start. They, before COVID, had lost millions um, and COVID has been the absolute turning point for their company and what they're trying to do. Um, Acara here in the middle is a robotics company and it's all AI powered uh, and it's basically a cleaning robot for theatres um, and they do it um, more methodically uh, and in a quicker time and the throughput then for th their goal as well is obviously to help support reduce waiting lists by getting surgeries and theatres cleaned uh, and, and the operation quicker. Um, Kinsetsu um, are a tracking solutions company and they have a very cool uh, I think it's K-Spot, they call it. It's tracking a uh, patient pathway. So from the point of entry to the point of exit. So when uh, a patient checks in there, it's recorded. When they go pre-op, it's recorded. When they go into surgery, night to skin. So it automates a process where there's usually loads of paperwork, etc. cetera. Um, and then obviously post-op and leaving the hospital. So it's, it's quite innovative as well. I think it's really, it's, it's quite a cool um, solution. Axel 3D, I'm sure many of you already know the Axel guys, but I, I was in with them a couple of weeks ago and just to see their imaging and 3D printing that they do, and it's all built on AI. Um, like they had this little guy's uh, had scoliosis in America and they had built this kid's spine uh, in, in a 3D print and it was printed the same thick, thickness, the granularity, the, the feeling of the the, the internal organs, it was just phenomenal because a surgeon then can use this to see how he will do the exact, uh, you know, kind of um, put the plates in or whatever into this wee guy's spine. It just, it just was incredible. And then the two other companies here, Vitro Software and Yellow Schedule are two Irish companies as well. And Yellow Schedule is, um, it's a, a, a timetabling application but it's automated uh, and it, it really reduces kind of um, admin time. And they work very closely with Vitro, um, that is your patient management, your electronic health records. Um, they really work, they've just uh, launched a new uh, uh, partnership called Smart List and we're working with them on that. And again, that's very much about offering an end-to-end -end solution to help tackle uh, hospital waiting lists. So there's so much more going on out there. Um, we, we could literally, it's a complete minefield. We could talk about it all night, but these are just some of the products that have kind of been on my radar and I've had experience with over the last while. And I just I find them to be brilliant companies. Um, another course that I'm going to give you um, is Elements of AI. For any of you who are interested in getting a certificate in AI, this is a fantastic course. And I am... Um, working my way through it um, and it takes you through just the world of AI and how it's been transformative um, and you get a lovely certificate at the end of it but if you are interested in finding out more if you would like to kind of really delve into the world of AI this is such a good place to start um, it, it's in a lovely language it's easily digested um, and I have to say I find it very very helpful but um, I'm going to leave you with one last thought um, and, and you know, maybe debate or discussion point. But for me, over the last while, um, when we have talked to uh, clinicians, uh, when we have talked to departments of health, when we've talked to trusts, when we've talked to you know, hospital performance directors and so on, there is a willingness for change, but there's still a lot of reluctance. There's a lot of cynicism. There's a lot of magical algorithms. You know, there's there's still a lot of resistance there for me, which I find quite frustrating because when it comes to the world of digital transformation, the three fundamental pillars are culture, strategy, and technology. And the first thing you have to get right is the culture because you could have the most amazing strategy 
and the most fabulous technology. But if you don't have the right culture in place, it doesn't matter. None of the other two are going to work. And I find this day in, day out that, you know, they're, they get excited about it. They think it's brilliant. But when it comes to actually driving that change, a lot of the time it isn't happening. And that's why there's a huge problem at the moment, because a lot of people are quite content to do what they've always done. They know all of this magical stuff that's here, but they're not really ready to embrace it. And for me, I would really, really love to get your thoughts on culture and how we start to shift that mindset into a more proactive, willing, unfearful uh, culture to, to actually start to really embrace AI. So folks, thank you so much. Those are my um, kind of observations from over the last while and my thoughts on, on where we're at and uh, look forward to your questions or thoughts. Thank you very much, Neve. That's fantastic. Great talk. Um, so lots covered there, and uh, definitely good for thought. Uh, we'll take into the panel session. Um, Bill, I just want to check if you can unmute your actual, and Fabian and Sinead, if you can unmute your mics and hopefully get yeah, yeah. Welcome, Bill, and see Sinead Hi, there. Yeah. Hi, and so I'm going to hand over to to Bill to to take us through the next um session. So I'll speak to you at the end. Thank you. Hi folks, that was a really good talk. Uh, I so enjoyed that. That was, that was actually really um, been a good start for my evening, I can say. So uh, thank oh, you so much for that. Thanks very much. Um, we're going to have a panel session very soon. Um, just wanted to reflect on some of the stuff there, because what I thought was really good is how many things that were talked about that are really important for AI in general. You know, and so a couple of things that really leapt out to me. AI is built by humans for humans. So that is so important. I thought that was great. Getting it right by building value for the client, customers, whatever, you know, that's the point of AI. Really, really important. The fact that you've got the difficulties around ch change because of that combination of culture and strategy and tech, you know, that is such a big thing as well. And it's, it's not just healthcare, it's in education, it's in defense, it's in retail, it's in wherever. Um, and the other thing that, that really leapt out at me is you better get your regulation right from the start and not think of it as something you add on at the end, which really can make things go wrong for people. And the fact that users don't understand their own data, which I also thought is just so common in so many areas. And again, it's the thing that, that is a real blocker for things to happen. So that, that was my own personal reflection on that talk. I'm so glad I heard that. And now I think what I need to do, and this is where I'm going to look so embarrassingly bad because I'm not good with Zoom and I've currently got three windows going. So let's see if we can make <laughs> this work. I'd just like to get the other panelists to introduce themselves. And uh, we're all right. So where are, oh, come on screen. Where are you, uh, Sinead McCracken? I'm here. <laughs> well, hi. Brilliant. <laughs> would you like to say hello and give a brief introduction to yourself? That Certainly helpful. I would. Um, so obviously my name is Sinead. Um, first of all, I just wanted to say I really enjoyed that presentation by Neve. Um, as a student doing um, a Master's of Science in Artificial Intelligence, it's just amazing to see how it actually works in a proper work environment and the challenges um, the possibilities um, and also the opportunities for the future. Now, these are things that I would read about. So it's it's amazing to actually have somebody chat about it. Um, I thought it was a very, very, uh, as I say, brilliant presentation and very honest as well. And and that's the one thing that I was I would always say about artificial intelligence, that it has so many possibilities. And that's what drew me to doing a master's in it. Um, you mentioned data a few times, and data for me is where it starts. Um, it, for me, artificial intelligence um, is discovering truths, amalgamating trusted sources of data, um, uncovering what we can't easily see 
from the amount of data available and what we don't already know. Um, so th those, are, those are just briefly, I, uh, just touching on a couple of, of, of the uh, items that Neve mentioned there personally. I, th I think as well, Shania, just to add on that is ethics. You know, um, we're very quick to blame the AI for the ethics, but it's actually the human input, the, 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 the you know, kind of um, the negatives in the, the, the data which is inputted by human hands before, you know, so there's a whole other debate in and around the ethics of AI as well. Which totally is agree with that, I totally agree. And I've come across, um, even from a personal perspective, sorry to interrupt there, I, I did one project on COVID and uh, sort of at the mercy of the collection of the data by the NHS trusts in England and Wales, it uncovers a, a lot more than what you even want, even where you even start with. So. Thanks, Sinead. And then I'd just like Fabian to uh, introduce yourself a bit. And, and actually, while, while you're at it, given that we've been talking about, you know, what does AI mean to you, perhaps you'd like to um, say a little bit about what it means for you, Fabian. Yeah, sure. Thanks very much, Bill. And thanks, uh, Neve, for your talk. Uh, my name's Fabian. I'm the, I've been working in AI for about 20 years now, um, long before it was cool. But uh, I'm the CTO and co-founder of a company called Leopa. We do automated lip reading. And our flagship product is uh, in the healthcare sector. It's for helping people who can't vocalize words to, to speak, to give them a voice. The way it works is using a smartphone camera, it will read your lips and then try and translate that to text. So a lot of the things that Neve touched on are, are, are very relevant for us. Um, I think Neve's definition of AI is, is actually a really good working one. I, I'd always thought of it as sort of non-trivial automated decision making that's my sort of succinct definition of it the non-trivial is important because at its core if you really define it it's strictly it can be very very simple and that's okay it's okay for AI to be simple it shouldn't be complex and I think a lot of the things Neve was touching on there is about almost the you know democratizing it so people get access to it and in doing so you dispel a lot of the myths about it as well so I think it, you know, another thing that was touched on there about the, the depth of data that people have, they don't really understand it. I think they also think that AI is a magic cure for, you know, giving them that insight without doing any, any work. But unfortunately, you get out what you put in. But um, yeah, automated decision making that serves a purpose. So it has to either make something quicker or do something that humans can't do that's error prone or do something that's really time consuming. Um, that's really what it is at its core. And it doesn't have to be complex. I think a lot of people use AI now as a term and they confuse a lot of new technologies with a lot of old technologies. So deep learning would be, and machine learning would be the newest ones that have very much become fashionable because of all the GPU power and they're the buzz terms, but AI can be quite simple. And, um, you know, Sinead touched on it as well. Understanding the data you have or data mining is like a whole field in itself. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of exciting things that can be done. And I think making it as accessible to people is, is a key thing. And part of that is educating people of what it is and what it's not. And I think crucially not letting people get scared of it. It seems like that course, I, I, haven't, I haven't done that one, but uh, you know, I've been working in this field for a long time. And I think the more you do, the more you realize it. a lot of it's actually quite simple and not, not to let people get put off by it and encouraging them. Thanks, Fabian. So that, that's interesting. So that sort of brings us into our second question. So why are people so scared of AI? I mean, you know, they, they, they seem to see lots of scare stories and they don't get it um, and they, they, they get very reactionary about it. So what does the panel think? And I've, I've, maybe the, the way to organise this is just jump in if you want to say something. Well, I'll just kind of give my overview of kind of based on current experience. I think there's a massive fear of people feeling like they're going to be caught out, mm -hmm. that they haven't been doing their job well enough, you know, and it's very much like our, our line is, it's not about, you know, kind of looking at what should have could have been done. It's about moving forward. It's about progress. It's about improving. So I think there's a reluctance to change in health services because they're comfortable doing what they do. 
um, and they don't want to have to learn something new. They don't want to have to do uh, anything else, you know, but from my perspective, I think and the, the bigger uh, kind of scope, um, you know, looking at my family even or my kids or whatever, you know, they're so technically savvy. It's nearly like an innate thing that they just go with it. Whereas if you're over a certain age, you know, it really does sound quite sci-fi-ish. Uh, and it's again, Fabian, it's a bit like what you said, you know, they're, they're scared of the unknown. They, they don't know what they don't know. So it's easier for them to run from it than to embrace it, even though they're exposed to it every day. They just don't know that that's the thing. So sometimes maybe ignorance is bliss, Bill. Yeah, I just to add to that, I, I, I couldn't agree more, but I think um, a lot of it's to do with the way it's reported. You hear a lot of the bad things that happen. You hear a lot of scaremongering. You get very privileged people like Elon Musk telling us that it's a threat and you know he's making billions off it. So I think I'll just indulge a, a little story because I was visiting my mum at the weekend and she uses an old mobile phone and she types every single character of a text message. And I try to get her to use predictive text, but she doesn't like it because she hears the word predictive text and she thinks it's trying to tell her what she should say. And it's, it's quite cute. She does, doesn't understand, but how we describe things is really important. So we all know predictive text doesn't really predict anything. It's just a smart sort of quick look up when you're typing, but how we describe things and how we talk about things can really turn people off, especially I think generationally like if you, if you tell a young person now that they have to, you know, have a webcam on or they have to take pictures of themselves, they don't even bat an eyelid. But a lot of people don't like the idea of a selfie um, and are quite turned off by it. So for our own technology, you need to use a camera on a phone to record your lips. And I think people, you can almost see a difference there of people who are embracing that and think, yeah, if it helps me, I'll do anything you want. Others are like, why have you got to take a picture? And it's just fascinating to me that the difference is opinion and not they're not it's not about right and wrong so you know Neve touched on ethics and I think privacy and being being good with data and, and treating it respectfully is is probably overlooked by a lot of people but uh yeah there's definitely this idea of how do you describe things how do you let people know that this isn't a threat to them it's it's actually a help it makes their life easier makes things quicker and I'm sure there are companies out there who are looking to sort of subvert that but Certainly what Neve's company is doing and what we're trying to do is, is speed things up. So from a personal point of view, and I, and I, as an old person, I get really freaked out when Google tries to figure out yeah. what my replies to my emails are going to be. Mm. And it does seem to be stalking me to think what, what, what is it I'm actually going to say next is quite unnerving. <laughs> I've yeah. now started deliberately trying to um, sort of rewrite my emails in different ways so it can't yeah. do or guess what I'm going to do next. But, uh, yeah. It's funny, um, I'm, I'm, doing, I'm going to get Johnny and Morris to cover their ears now when I say this. I'm doing a, a week course in Queen's um, and we were doing a, it, it's innovation strategy and digital disruption, right? And uh, we were talking about Stitch Fix as a case study and, you know, about innovation and blah, blah, blah. I'm not kidding you. And like, I've been around this game a long time when it comes to retargeting and, you know, advertising and everything else. Stitch Fix was the first ad on my Instagram when I got home. And I just thought, <laughs> I've never looked at it. I've never, I was the first ad. And I was like, they are recording, you know? So that it, is, it is a bit freaky, but do we just accept it now and just kind of get on? How many times do you, when you go on a new website and it says, you know, accept all cookies and you just hit accept so that you can continue with your browsing. If we were actually to go and delve into what the cookie tracking was, I think we would probably be a bit more cautious before hitting accept all, but we don't because it's all about kind of pace. But yeah, yeah no, that, that, that kind of freaks me out too, Bill, even still. I think for young people, that's a... this convenience. Oh, sorry. Go, on, no, go ahead. I was just going to say for young people, say yeah, for young people too, they don't read them because they don't know. They don't know any different. They don't know any better. So I did a, a lecture on this once about um, Snapchat when it was back when it was popular. If you look at the requirements that the Snapchat ask, app asks when you install it, it asks for everything. It asks to read your messages. It asks mm. to record. 
And it doesn't need all those permissions for what it's ostensibly doing. But these are actually surveillance applications, Facebook as well, and I'm not picking on social media, but everybody has it and you see that everyone else has it. So you think it's all right, but that doesn't mean that it is. So I think, you know, to your point about the Google thing, it's like, do you want the service and are you paying for it? Because if you're not paying for it, then you are the service. It's the old adage. And I personally have a view that if you want the benefit of it, then you have to give something back. And some of the bigger companies like Amazon got in trouble, obviously, for, for not being very careful with people's recordings and they are absolutely recording what you say on your phone so we shouldn't accept it I don't think but we also shouldn't try and stop progress because not all companies are doing bad things with it so I'm sure you know the stimuli solution requires some amount of patient information but if it means it reduces waiting lists by 80 percent then I'm personally all for it but you know for our solution you have to record a, a video of the person's face because you can't do any processing unless you do that but some people may not like the video to be recorded and you've got to you've got to meet these solutions part way but definitely some companies are not doing things correctly so i think you really hit on something Please. because uh, we did a survey last year sorry who's sorry sorry it's Janiers. i was just going to say just oh, basically right. and i'm sure it's I'm sure it's one of those things everybody sort of probably agree with i think everybody's sort of afraid of technology when they don't understand it mm -hmm. you know um, maybe people are afraid it's going to take over their jobs or, you know, something like that. Um, but I, I definitely think it's def it's not something to be afraid of at the minute because AI is not at the stage where it's even near its full potential. So th those fears are unfounded and I don't think its potential is even being realized. And maybe that's the communication as well with the public needs to be you know more sort of clarified um so there's more understanding of the take up of these things get you know that can you know potentially benefit mm -hmm. in the long run whether it's um for health or work or whatever I think those are really good points. I think, I think going back to one of the things that Fabian and Neve were saying, it, it feels as if a bit like when people can really appreciate what the benefits are they're going to get, um, they're more comfortable around the way their, their data gets sort of sucked out and used for things. So, you know, although I think, feel it's a bit creepy when Google are telling me how to write an email, I really value having the email. I really value the things that it does for me so I can kind of live with it. Um, and when we did a survey some time ago, uh, well, a year ago, um, and it was across all four nations, the response pretty much across all of the different nations was that people are not comfortable when AI is used to make decisions about them, but they like it when it's being used to help them do something. And that seems to be the bit where, it, where you've got that kind of difference between the being nervous of it and embracing it. So maybe that should take us on to the next question. So what are the real positives that are coming out of AI that we haven't had before? You know, what, what's so great about it now compared to what we were capable of doing? Um, and what do you think we might be able to see in the future as things are moving forward? And let's not get too ambitious here. Let's think over maybe the next five years. Who wants to start on that one? I can go first, if you like. I think, um... One of the things I've seen is a lot more people talking about it and a lot more people doing it. So I was really impressed with what Neve said that um, I know she's a serial entrepreneur, but she's obviously moved into this AI space and learned a lot very quickly. And there's never been a better time. Like if, if I wanted to be a doctor, I can't just decide to be a doctor. If I want to be a lawyer and accountant, I have to do a lot of work, but anyone with a computer can start programming and, and working this stuff out. And I'm not saying that everyone's going to change the world, but there's something cool about the fact that this is open to literally anybody. I mean, fair enough, you need to buy a reasonable machine, but I think it's, there's never been a better time to learn this stuff. And it is exciting what people come up with. And even if they don't solve it by themselves, they might come up with new ideas and new solutions. And you know, some of the best books I've read are about just simple life hacks where you use technology to make your own life easier and, and faster. And I think it's that empowerment that the more you read about it, the more you learn about the truth, the, the less scared you are, um, you know, to Sinead's previous point, I've, I've become pretty cynical because as a startup, you need to raise money. 
So you need to talk from the rooftops that your solution is amazing and it's really complicated. And sometimes I've seen a lot of companies who claim to be using AI, they're, they sort of are, but it's more and more tenuous. So, and I'm not obviously talking about my own or, or uh, Neve's company here, but you know, AI is a broad thing, right? So sometimes it's simpler, but you can't say that. And I think that's part of the, the, the problem is, you know, headlines get printed when there's scandal, when there's complexity and people are scared. Like it almost you know, perpetuates, perpetuates itself. I think the more that these courses exist, the more that people can say, we're using AI, but this is what we're doing with it. And to your point, Bill, it, if it helps people rather than, you know, the, the decision-making that's it's sort of a black box, that is a bit dodgy. And it's, that's where a lot of things like bias come in. Mm-hmm. And, and Neve touched on that in her talk. I think a lot of, I mean, bias absolutely comes from the data, but you know, I've got several funny stories from my career, but a lot of the bias isn't intentional by any means. These are people who are, you know, overworked and perhaps underpaid, and they're just firing data into these models. And they sit back and they think, oh, yeah, it's working. I've got 90% accuracy. And they don't think about the broad population. So I'd say a lot of the mistakes that get made aren't really intentional. They're, they're sort of accidental. But what I see in the future is a lot more people trying lots of crazy stuff. Some Some's useful, some isn't. But you never know when the next one is going to really change the world. So I'd never, it never occurred to me in, in 20 years that you'd use AI to solve waiting times. But I've seen people use, I think, maybe similar technology for sort of shift rotations with police forces and like strategical decision making. And mm-hmm. I think what stimuli are doing is really exciting because it's sort of proven and it, it's that sort of risk free where no one loses here. And I, I just think yeah. it's exciting. Yeah. Well, Fabian, can you come with me and, and say that as kind of like a back in support? <laughs> yeah, sure, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, because it, it, it is that, it's the fear of the unknown, as I've said before, but for me, being able to do something that actually has impact on people's lives, you know, that, that whole tech for good, that excites me the most, that it is adding real value, that it is making a difference, Um, you know, uh, and that's, you know, aside from potentially building a fantastic business um, the opportunity to drive and do something that actually makes a difference you know actually excites me the most and that the potential the unlock potential that AI kind of gives us um, so no I, I, I can't wait to see the different products that come to market over the next while and not just in healthcare obviously you know mm-hmm. even looking at retail if you look at construction if you look at manufacturing and everything and how you know the world of kind of artificial intelligence is developing into just everyday life so unlocking that potential is what excites me the most so if i go to Sinead, see if do you have yes, any other comments certainly on, on yeah discussion? um for me the, the big positive is you, you can have a problem you can resolve it you can build your models you can get to your certain amount of factors saying you're happy with it but what you'll find is how much other things that you can potentially investigate further, resolve, um, uncover. And it's just to me, as what Neve said, it's the potential. And that for me is the big thing is the creativity aspect on it. You just don't know sometimes where that data is going to lead you. And that's what I've tried to do by doing my master's is not focus, is, is try to look at the data get good, good data from reliable sources, amalgamate tables from different places, use big data and look at what that showed me, scan it, um, you know, read it, try and not uh, delete stuff out that you don't need to remove and just see where that leads me and what I can uncover without, and it's this is probably uh, a benefit of being at university, maybe I'm not in business, I'm not looking to and uh, prove something I'm looking to see where that leads me and what I can create you know be, where I can be creative and that for me is where the excitement is and, and the passion lies is in what AI can actually where it can lead you and what, and what you can do with it and and how you can improve something. Damien can I just comment on your point and it's a completely valid comment uh, my dad and, and one that we get regularly um, the reality is with our particular product, um, we're trying to alleviate that pain from clinicians and the, the, their team. So we work with the back end. Uh, so you're talking service users, admin, performance, 
So that kind of operational side. So we're a strategic planning tool on the operation side as opposed to the day to day. See everything you have said there. We get that said at least three times a day. You know, they're exhausted. You're absolutely right. Resources are low. They're overwhelmed. But the beauty of what we're trying to do, we can be interoperable or we can be standalone, depending on how they want to plug and play our system. We don't actually need reams and reams and reams of patient data. In actual fact, our data is all anonymized, baby. And just going back to your point, it's, it's anonymized information. What we're really concerned with is the patient type, category and time. Uh, and it's creating that demand model before it gets to the point of where the clinician and his team have to worry about it. So, um, and I've had many of the conversation with doctors over the last year and they, you know, the, the running joke is don't come near me with it. I don't want to know anything about it. They just want the results that makes their life easier. And that's exactly what we're trying to do. So if you can imagine like a tier one, tier two and tier three and tier one is that strategic planning. Tier two is um, operational delivery and then tier three is patient pathway. We're really up at that top point of strategic planning. So at that high level, how what are our KPIs? What is our RTT rate? You know, if you look at the, the NHS constitution, their RTT was six weeks, right? They're currently sitting on about 1% of that target right now. So why is that? Why is the problem there? You know, they've just spent 6 billion, 5.9 billion to put 100 diagnostic hubs around the UK to try and help with that. Well, if they don't have the staff, in the current hospitals, where are they going to get the staff to facilitate another 100 diagnostic hubs? You know, like this is all marketing media for me. This isn't going to have any impact. This is just going to be a waste of 5.9 billion pounds. Um, and if you read into that, you know, so completely, completely valid point. Um, we would look to plug in. We utilize the packs, uh, the, the data. We're looking to work with the Encompass team in Epic. And it's about plugging into that whole supply chain. But fundamentally, it's looking after our practitioners and it's looking after our patients. Because if we don't get that right, there's no delivery. So you're completely right in that. It might come as a shock to some of the people. Forgive me, it might come as a shock to some of the people on the call that the primary system that supports our hospitals in Northern Ireland, the PAC system, effectively started being rolled out in the in the 80s it was designed in the 70s so we're sitting with 1.8 million people five trusts eight passes so obviously encompass is going to take those out take those out but uh, you know you're you, you know we're dealing with a lot of systems here who were born where a number of people on this call weren't even born you know <laughs> Uh, I, 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 I remember the first pack, the PAS going into the Royal in 1984-85. And, you know, healthcare has moved on tremendously since then. So mm -hmm. I could go into uh, a long discussion about, you know, how IT has, has been a, a poor relation in terms of the amount of money spent on it. We're playing catch up all the time, but mm -hmm. we're still running with systems that are on the PAS side, the best part of 50 year old and running in silos and not looking at how we communicate with, you know, other trusts. And absolutely, so, absolutely. You know, we're, 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 uh, I've recently had an experience as a consumer of the health service myself. Mm -hmm. So it was an uh, interesting perspective, you know, having been in the, on, on the inside looking out for a long time, uh, yeah. much more closely now looking in, I see that. Yeah, and Damien, you know what? That is such a valid comment because it's not until somebody experiences it themselves that they realize the state of affairs and then they have a new lease of life to try and help fix it you know so it, it, and people don't see you know when you're in a nine to five um they don't see the commodity of somebody's livelihood and, and wellness and that's the thing that gets me is like patients who are waiting like we did a piece of work with the national institute of health research on health economics and our statistics, uh, when we did a cost benefit analysis, our statistic was the mort mortality percentage of people on waiting lists. You know, and you're thinking, how in this day and age is that actually possible? You, we, we, there's case studies upon case studies. There's a guy that needed gallstones removed. He ended up getting sepsis and was completely debilitated. So the gallstones is the least of his worries at this stage of the game. And he still hasn't had surgery. And his well-being is just, you know, his plummeted 
So there, there's all of these things to, to think about the bigger picture. And I personally, you know, we're still governed by politics, by bureaucracy, by hierarchy procurement. Like we'll have that conversation offline, but unless there is buy-in, we'll go back to that part, part of culture. Culture has to change to embrace it, to make it happen. And I know, like if I, I know Shane uh, McKee would usually be here as well. Like Shane is just such an advocate for this, you know, for EHR is to really make it work, to really make a difference. And I, I just get frustrated when you can see the opportunity, but the people in power won't actually press the green light to make it happen. Can we delete that bit? So, <laughs> so like with any excellent panel, you've overrun. Um, so rather Sorry. than me summarise what people have said, as I say, this is an excellent panel. So I, that's absolutely right. Um, there have been so many excellent things here that we've talked about. So, so many interesting things that obviously we can't go on all night. And uh, I've seen the questions popping up in the chat that we don't have time to talk about. But hopefully there'll be an opportunity to come back to this on another occasion so that we can, we, we can further on the discussion. But I think now on the grounds that I need to do, try and do my duty as, as the chair of the panel and hand back, rather than try and summarise and take more time, I am going to hand back to Sinead and, and let her conclude the meeting. Great. Thank you so much for joining that panel because I so enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Bill. That's excellent. And yes, we would want to go on for another um, half hour and all, but I do um, agree in the interest of time that unfortunately we have to cut it. But what I would say is that, you know, we started this conversation. I think this is a really good group. Um, we'll take it away and maybe have further conversations and have another event, maybe um, plan it for next year as well, just to, to, to keep things going. So, and there's a number of questions there, unfortunately, as Bill says, we didn't get to do it. But, you know, from this evening, um, Neve, thank you so much. It's been a wonderful insight. It's helped us to, I say, debunk the myths and actually have a, a you know, a cold conversation about that and reality of, of, you know, what AI can make a difference and how it makes a difference. And that's what we want to do. It's all about getting the outcome, outcomes that are needed. Um, it ties in very much with what BCS and as IT professionals, um, we do have a, you know, a duty to actually act professionally and AI is going to become more to the fore in terms of the ethics and the behaviours and the bias. And that's a whole big, again, ties into your culture piece as well to Neve in terms of behaviours and how we act together. So it's exciting times. I think it's very good. It's great that you all came to the panel with different. Sinead, thank you very much for leading the panel in terms of students. You know, you take that away in terms of representing all on their new journeys. Thank you, Fabian, for actually talking to us about how it actually works in terms of your changes you make and how, you know, the insights you've got from your work experience, that one, and Neve for leading us off and, and doing that. And Bill for navigating through this. Um, it's a difficult one to talk. It's a difficult one to, to actually navigate get around we can go off in very many different ways but tonight we've been very positive we've learned a lot we've taken away um i would just like to again express my thanks to everybody for giving up the time um we are in debt to people this is you know outside of their normal activities everybody's very busy busy lives um so you know these things don't happen just by turning up today there's preparation there's time goes into it there's meetings in advance so thank you to everybody who helped out in that one as well too and um I think the best thing that I can say now is thank you. Have a very good evening. Enjoy the rest of your evening. And um, we look forward to meeting you all again. So thank you for everybody and have a good evening. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.